Blog Talk Radio. Baruch Hashem, this is Mark Walter coming to you live on this eighth day of October 2019. The guest call-in number is 917-889-8827. That's 917-889-8827. This is Fundamentally Mormon. We are broadcasting live on Facebook.com forward slash L-A-Z. U R U S nineteen seventy seven and you can also like I said call in to the, the phone number. I'll give that number again at the end of the reading. Today we are getting into chapter fourteen of the Church and the Gospel. The chapter title is The Kingdom of God and we'll get into that right at this point. All right. So well actually I'll just explain. <laughs> so um we are packing and we're getting ready to move. So we're, uh, so, you know, if I want to do the radio show, this is kind of what I got to do right now. So anyway, but, um, oh, you can also read for free, uh, the text to what we're reading and get the links to the radio show and the, uh, the video podcast at fundamentally mormon.com. The Kingdom of God, Chapter 14 of The Church and the Gospel by Ogden Kraut. Definition and Distinction. The subject of the Kingdom of God is a grand central theme interwoven throughout the pages of scriptures. There are more references in the New Testament to the Kingdom of God than there are to the Church of Christ. It was the main subject of John's Book of Revelations. It was the principal topic of John the Baptist, and the gospel itself is called the gospel of the kingdom. For establishing that kingdom, Christ, our Messiah, was brought uh, brought to trial and crucified, and it is to rule over the kingdom that Christ will come again, to reign over all other kingdoms and nations. If the church were more important than the kingdom, Why didn't Christ say, seek ye first the church, rather than seek ye first the kingdom of God? The importance of this subject cannot be ignored nor overlooked. But if we are to seek first this kingdom, we need to know what it is. If If we are ignorant of its meaning, it is impossible for us to seek it at all. For thousands of years... Thousands of churches have their private interpretation on the kingdom of God and the church of Christ. Some have said that the kingdom has not yet been on the earth or that it, it was here only during the ministry of Jesus, Yeshua. Others have said that the church of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, is the same as the kingdom of God. So for those of you following along at FundamentallyMormon.com, we are on page uh, 216. You can also read the full text to this book at OgdenKraut.com. Once you get on the main page, click on Read Ogden's Books and scroll down to The Church and the Kingdom. It's all in alphabetical order. There's about 70 books there for you to read for free online. Page 216. The definition and distinction, however, was not made clear until the gospel was was restored in this dispensation. For example, John Taylor began his book on on that subject with a simple yet comprehensive definition, quote, this is John Taylor, the kingdom of God is the government of God on the earth or in the heavens, end quote, the government of God, page one. And from Brigham Young, quote, what is the kingdom of God? When we talk about kingdoms, we talk about government, rule, authority, power. For wherever there is a kingdom, these principles exist to, the greater, to a greater or lesser extent. Journal of Discourses, Volume 6, page 19. The nature and size of the government may extend from a man's home to a state. A, um, a nation or even a universe So however extensive The government may become So also can the kingdom Of God become The necessary compon- components Of a kingdom were correctly Itemized by Herbert W. Armstrong when he stated Four things are necessary To constitute a kingdom Number one, the territory With a specific location and definition And de- 
definite boundary lines. Number two, a king or a supreme ruler or governing agent ruling over it. Number three, subjects or citizens within that territorial jurisdiction <clears throat> from what, number four, laws laws in form of government, and quote, the true gospel by Herbert W. Armstrong, page eight. If any, of, if any one of these four vital elements are not present, then there is not an operate, operative government or kingdom. Let's identify these four areas. Number one, the territory, number two, the king, number three, the subjects, and number four, the laws. Religiously and politically speaking, <clears throat> page 217, number one, the territory is the universe. Number two, the king is Yehovah our Elohim. Number three, the, subject, the subjects are all his children. And number four, the laws are his gospel. What an all-encompassing encompassing concept if this be true how can anyone believe that the kingdom of god and the church of jesus christ yeshua hamashiach are the same thing i keep saying yeshua hamashiach because yeshua was the name of jesus when he lived upon the earth it was not jesus jesus is a transliteration and if you speak latin or spanish his name is jesus you know but it's not that either it's Yeshua. So, uh, and Hamashiach is the Hebrew name for what the Aramaic name is of Messiah, and the Greek name is Christ. But in Hebrew, Hamashiach or Mashiach, well, Hamashiach means the Messiah, Mashiach means Messiah. Messiah is Aramaic for that, and then uh, Christ is the Greek term that they chose because. That, you know, the Greeks had a hard time saying Yeshua, or I think they they named him Jesus. Eventually, it got changed to uh, to Jesus. Anyway, if there's any questions or comments uh, before I take phone calls, uh, I am watching the live stream on Facebook, and uh, I'll try to keep an eye out for any questions or comments there. Unfortunately, however. That is a general assumption, even among the members of the LDS Church today. But first, let's review what some of the church leaders had to say. John Taylor, quote, God has established his church, and we sometimes say his kingdom. What do we mean by the kingdom of God? There is the church of God and the kingdom of God. The church, of course, refers more particularly to the spiritual things and the and the kingdom to temporal rule and government and management and temporal affairs. End quote. John Taylor, Journal of Discourses, volume 20, page 166. H. Roberts, quoting Joseph Smith, stated, The Church of Christ, precious as it is, beloved by its great head, in the harmony of its truth, perfect, it's in the beauty of <clears throat> its holiness, passing all praise, in its power of salvation, absolute. Yet the church of Christ, or the church of Messiah, or the ecclesia of Jehovah, will doubtless stand under the pro protecting urges of the kingdom of God in, a common, in common with other systems of religion enjoying only such rights as will be common to all. And while the Church of Christ will enjoy to the full her privileges, promulgating her faith with, without let or hindrance, make known the truth she holds and her saving grace and power and manage, and manage her own affairs, yet she will not usurp the, per, the, the kingdom of God on the earth or in the heavens nor interfere with those outside of, of the pell of her juris, jurisdiction, outside of her membership. Such in substance was the teachings of the prophet on this subject, or on page 218. It will be understood then that what I have quoted from the prophet Joseph Smith's discourses on the subject of the kingdom of God is spoken broadly in a sense which recognizes the kingdom of God simply as the government of God on the earth or in heaven. 
End quote. Rise and Fall of Nauvoo by Roberts, page 181. The Apostle Orson Pratt stated, The kingdom of God is the only legal government that can exist in any part of the universe. All other governments are illegal and unauthorized. Yehovah our Elohim, having made all beings and worlds, has the supreme right to govern them by his own laws and and by officers of his own appointment. Any people attempting to govern themselves by laws of their own make. Oh, hold on. But uh, we just had the. Uh, so welcome back. Uh, the uh, the the Facebook just decided it wanted to uh, reset itself. So I'll continue on. Any people attempting to govern themselves by laws of their own making and by officers of their own appointment are in direct rebellion rebellion against the kingdom of God. And quote the kingdom of God, written by Orson Pratt, page one, written in eight, or published in 1851. So any of you that are watching this, um, I'll post all of these videos. Uh, Facebook decided to take a crash, and I won't be able to do YouTube right now. I tried to, but it's not letting me for some reason. Um, you can find the full um, audio later on if you want to listen to the whole thing at fundamentallymormon.com or at blogtalkradio.com forward slash fundamentallymormon. Continuing on with the reading, <clears throat> B.H. Roberts. Quote, but it is proper for, that, for the reader to know that Joseph Smith, when speaking strictly, recognized the distinction between the church of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. And not only a distinction, but a separation of, of one from the other. The kingdom of God, according to his teaching, is to be a political institution that shall hold sway over all the earth to which all other governments will be subordinate and by which they will be dominated. Of this kingdom, Christ is the king, for he is to reign as king of, king of, sorry, king of kings and lord of lords, while all other governments are to be in subjection to the kingdom of God. It does not follow that all its members will be of one religious faith. The kingdom of God is not necessarily made up exclusively of the members of the church of Yeshua or Jesus Christ. In fact, the prophet Joseph Smith taught that men not members of the church could, be, could not only be members of that kingdom, but also officers within it. So basically what he's saying is that, and Brigham Young, and he'll, we'll get into this quote later, Brigham Young and Joseph Smith taught that there would be officers in that kingdom that were not members of the Church of Jesus Christ upon the earth in the millennium. Something interesting to consider. Anyway, but also officers within it. It is to grant the wildest religious toleration, or the widest, I'm sorry. It is to grant the widest religious toleration through exacting homage and loyalty loyalty to its great head and its institutions and obedience to its laws. On the other hand, the Church of Christ is purely an ecclesiastical organization comprising within its membership only those who have embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are on page 2 219. Let me see here. Um, Sam ba Sam ba uh, Sam Bato Francis, can you please help our nonprofit organization, Elma Ch Charity School? And um, please don't advertise on my live radio programs. Uh, you can contact people individually through Facebook, but if you do it again, I will block you from the from my profile. Uh, part of the reason I do that is because I receive a ton of people all around the world that are asking me for money and trying to use my platform to raise money. <clears throat> now, I know some of these organizations are legit. 
The reason why I have a hard time sending money to any of them is because anyone in the world can copy and paste off of a website photos and images and create charters and anything else to to make a school or an orphanage or whatever charity look legit in their scams. And so I don't support them. I support I support Christians in the area that I know where I, I am. So like um we uh my family works at a food pantry, uh a Pentecostal food pantry in Price, Utah from time to time and we support that ministry because we know that that ministry is actually doing what they say they're going to do. Hi Tina, long time no see. So anyway, um Getting back to the reading, we're in the Church and the Gospel by Ogden Kraut. We're on page 219, which you can read for free at fundamentallymormon.com. All right, I'm I'm just going to start the sentence over. Uh, Let's see here. On the other hand, the Church of Jesus Christ is purely an ecclesiastical organization comprising within its membership Only those who have embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ, who inwardly have accepted its principles in their faith and outwardly have received the rites and ceremonies it prescribes. Of this church, Jesus Christ is the head, since he is to be Lord of Lords as well as King of Kings. End quote, Rise and Fall of Nauvoo by Roberts, page 180 through 181. Brigham Young, quote, as, far, as was observed by Brother Orson Pratt, that kingdom is actually organized and the inhabitants of the earth and the inhabitants of the earth do not know it. If this people know anything about it, all right, it is organized preparatory to taking effect in due time of the Lord and in the manner that shall please him. As observed by one of the speakers this morning, that kingdom grows out of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but it is not the church. For a man may be a legislator in that body which will issue laws to sustain the inhabitants of the earth in their individual rights and still not belong to the Church of Jesus Christ at all. And quote Brigham Young, Journal of Discourses, Volume 2, page 310. Brigham Young also stated, oh, I don't know why this thing, this keyboard that I have here, this Bluetooth keyboard, it, it it's given me issues. Anyway, uh, continuing on, for your satisfaction, I will present some of my views concerning the kingdom of God and leave the subject for others to elaborate. Erroneous traditions and the powers of darkness have such sway over mankind that when we speak of a theocracy on the earth, the people are frightened. But few, if any, understand what a theocratic government is. In every sense of the word, it is a republican government and differs little, but little from our, for, uh, little in f- form from our national, state, and territorial governments but its subjects will recognize the will and the dictation of the Almighty. The kingdom of God circumscribes and comprehends the the municipal laws for the people in their outward government, to which pertain the, the, the gospel covenants by which the people can be saved. And those covenants pertain to fellowship and faithfulness. Page 220 of The Church and the Gospel by Ogden Kraut, which you can read for free online at fundamentallymormon.com. The Gospel Covenants are for those who believe and obey. Municipal laws are both for the saint and the sinner. The Constitution and the laws of the United States resemble a theocracy more closely than any government now on the earth or that ever has been, so far as we know, except the government of the children of Israel to the time when they elected a king. Governments are more or less under the control of the Almighty and in their forms 
have sprung from the laws that he has from time to time given to man. Those laws in passing from generation to generation have been more or less adulterated, and the result has been the various forms of government now in force among the nations of the earth. For as the prophet says of Israel, quote, they have transgressed the laws. This is Isaiah that he's quoting. They have transgressed the laws, or in Hebrew, they have transgressed the Torah, changed the ordinances. Actually, this might be Jeremiah. Anyway, we'll see. And broken the everlasting covenant. Oh, it doesn't give me a quote as to where that is. That's weird. Uh, well, it's not because it was uh, Brigham Young speaking in a conference address, and he quoted it, but he didn't give chapter and verse. I think that is Isaiah, but it could be Jeremiah. I know it's one or the other. E either way, it's still scripture. Continuing on, whoever lives to see the kingdom of God fully established on the earth will see a government that will protect every person in his rights. If that government was now reign, reigning upon the land of Joseph or Yosef, you would see the Roman Catholic, the Greek Catholic, the Episcopalian, the Presbyterian, the Methodist, the Baptist, the Quaker, the Shaker, the Hindu, and the Mohammedan, and every class of worshiper most strictly protected in all their municipal rights and the privilege of worshiping who, what, and when they please not infringing upon the rights of others. Does any candid person in his sound judgment desire any greater liberty? The Lord has thus far protected and preserved the human family under their various forms and, and administrators of government, notwithstanding their wickedness, and is still preserving them. But if the kingdom of God or a theocratic government was established on the earth, Many practices now prevalent would be abolished. One community would not be permitted to array itself in opposition to another to cohort, coerce, <coughs> excuse me, coerce them in their uh, to their standard. One denomination would not be suffered to persecute another because they differ in religious belief and mode of worship. Page two twenty one. Everyone would be fully protected in the enjoyment of all religious and social rights. And no state, no government, no community, no person would have the privilege of infringing upon the rights of, of, uh, of another. One Christian community would not rise up and persecute another. That is what happened in the early history of the Restoration. When the kingdom of God is established, we can believe in the principles of the eternal priesthood or in something else and be equally protected in our outward rights. My law, says Jehovah, is pure. It is the law by which the worlds were made and by which all things are. Those laws, it, it, are, those laws tend to exalt, exaltation and power, but the world is observing rules that tend to death. It is recorded in the Bible that the last, in the last days, the God of heaven, or Jehovah our Elohim, will set up a kingdom that will destroy, that, and that kingdom will, de will destroy the human family? No. It will save every person that will and can be saved. The municipal laws of that kingdom are designed for the protection of all classes of people in their legitimate rights. And were it now in its fullness upon the earth, the new Jerusalem built upon this continent, which is the land of Zion, the Latter-day Saints would not alone enjoy its blessings, but all denominations and communities would be alike protected in their rights, whether they worship the supreme author of our existence or the sun or the moon or, as do some of our aborigines, a white dog. And none will be permitted to infringe upon their neighbors, though every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, is the Christ. The Hindu would have the privilege of erecting their temples and of worshiping as they pleased.
but they would not be permitted to compel other worshipers to conform to their mode of worship, nor to burn their companions upon the funeral funeral pyre, for that would interfere with the individual right. I'm going to, somebody uh, said something here. I'm going to see if I, oh, okay, Sam, Sambato, Sambato, Francis, says, I am a member of the church, and I cannot lie. I go to the temple. My favorite scripture is Alma chapter 5. It helps me understand that in anything that I do in this mortal life, I will be accountable, and I cannot lie to God at the last day. So what I am doing is real. I'm not lying to people, but rather I'm helping a lot of people. I'm sorry that I sent our website asking for your for your help. Anyway, okay, um, yeah, and you can like post on you know ask people individually and all of that. I just there's too many people contacting me and trying to post in my walls and in my threads and in my videos uh, asking for money and uh, books and like. So I had a I had a, a, a supposed church over in, in uh, Pakistan asking me. They said that they needed Bibles for their members, and they were asking me uh, if I would send money. And I said, Well, I can send extra Bibles. And they didn't want the Bibles, they just wanted the money. So, I mean, it's just, there's a lot of scams, uh, especially that come out of Africa, but all over the earth, even in the United States, uh, where people are setting up uh, fake organizations and trying to, to, um, trying to get people to send them money so that they can do whatever it is they want with it, so... Hey, Jordan, sorry. Uh, yeah, we had uh, the Facebook drop for some reason. But like I said, I'm going to post these videos. And um, anybody can listen to the whole podcast for free. Okay. Uh, anybody can po- uh, listen to the whole podcast or radio show for free at fundamentallymormon.com or at blogtalkradio.com forward slash fundamentallymormon. Uh, we also broadcast or post our podcast on iTunes under Fundamentally Mormon. So uh, people can go there if they want to listen to the whole thing. And I'm sorry about the videos. This new house that we're moving into, we got the papers for it. We're moving in November 1st. I'll have my own office that I can lock the door that's not connected to any other room. And it's going to be great. I'm going to set up my studio in there. And the only people that will be able to go in there are me and my wife. So it'll be, it's going to be nice. Like, we're very, very excited that that it's a six-bedroom house. Um, It's got 10 acres of property. Uh, We're leasing part of that to uh, a farmer who's going to cut the hay in the field because we don't have equipment. So, um, all right, um, some, some bato. Um, I'm going to allow this for you during this radio show. Tell us what your organization is, and I'll read it so that the people on the air can know it too that are listening, uh, because this is a live radio program. Um, and let me know what it is that you guys are, uh, your goals and what you're, what you're looking to achieve and let us know where you're from. I know I've talked to you before and I've seen where you are from before, but the, the people don't know. And I don't remember, like literally my messenger on Facebook is just people all the time. And I get so many people trying to contact me and waving at me and saying hi to me that I lose track of people pretty quick. So and sorry about that. It's kind of the way it is. But let us know where you're from and what your organization is hoping to do uh, and why you need donations for uh, for your the organization. Also, if the directors live in uh, Arizona, as you are saying, um, is that where people are sending the money to or are they sending it off somewhere else? So let us know in the comments on Facebook, and then I'll read it at the end of the program. I'll scroll back up. Anyway, so continuing on 
with the reading, the kingdom that the Almighty will set up in the latter days will have its officers, and those officers will be peace. Every man that officiates in a public capacity will be filled with the spirit of Jehovah, or the spirit of God, in the light of God, with the power of God, and will understand right from wrong, truth from error, light from darkness. Page 222 of the Church and the Gospel. That which tends to life and that which tends to death. When the government of God is in force upon the earth, there will be many officers and branches to that government as there now are to that of the United States. There will be such helps, governments, etc., as the people require in their several capacities and circumstances, for the Lord will not administer everywhere in person. When the kingdom of God is established upon the earth, people will find it to be very different from what they now imagine. Will it be in the least degree tyrannical and oppressive towards any human being? No, it will not. For such is not the kingdom of God. I believe in a true republican theocracy and also in a true democratic theocracy as the term de- democratic is now used but there are for they are to me in their pleasant or present use convertible terms <clears throat> what do i understand by a theocratic government <coughs> excuse me one in which all the laws are enacted and executed in righteousness and whose officers possess that power which prode- which proceedeth from the Almighty. That is the kind of government I allude to when I speak of the theocratic government or the kingdom of God upon the earth. It is, in short, the eternal powers of the gods or of the Elohim. What do the world understand theocracy to be? A poor, rotten government of man that would would say without the shadow of provocation or just cause, cut that man's head off. Because that's what the that's what the government that's what the kingdom, the Catholic Church that's what they did. The Catholic Church is not the kingdom of God. It never was and never will be. The Catholic Church was formed by Roman a Roman emperor named Constantine, not Peter, but Constantine, who hijacked Christianity for the first portion of the early Christian history, the Roman Empire and the Jews sought to murder Christians. Eventually, they just took it over and hijacked it. Anyway, cut that man's head off and put one on the rack, arrest another, and retain him in unlawful and unjust duress while you plunder his property, pollute his wife and daughters, massacre here and there. The Lord Almighty does nothing of that kind, neither does any man who is controlled by his spirit. When his kingdom is established upon the earth, the Zion built up, the Lord will or will send his servants as saviors upon Mount Zion. The servants of God who have lived on the on the earth in ages past will reveal where different persons have lived who died with and who died without the gospel give their names and say now go forth ye servants of god and exercise your rights and privileges and go and perform the ordinances of the house of god for those who have passed their probation without the law and for all who will receive any kind of salvation bring them up to inherit the celestial the terrestrial and the celestial kingdoms, and probably many other kingdoms not mentioned in the scriptures. For every person will receive according to his capacity and according to the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad, much or little. Journal of Discourses, Volume 6, page 342 through 347. Ancient prophecies. 
Many of the ancient prophets foretold that in the latter days, God would establish his kingdom. After Daniel described the beast representing the, king, the latter day kingdoms of the world, he said, quote, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven, Yehovah our Elohim, set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all of these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou thoughtst that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces, and the iron, the brass, the clay, and silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. Daniel chapter 2, verses 44 through 45. Also, quote, And I saw in the night vision. Behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. That Ancient of Days is Father Michael, uh, Michael Adam. And we find that out through modern revelation. Also in Daniel chapter 12, it talks about that. But the Ancient of Days is the Ancient of All, and he is over the kingdom of God. Um, <clears throat> he's over the whole earth. He's the father of the whole earth. We are adopted to him as his children, spiritually and physically. All right. Um, oh, and the whole, the whole thing about one like unto the Son of Man drives me a little bit nuts because everybody thinks it's Jesus that's coming, but it's not. So we find out in Scripture that Jesus comes in the clouds and that he will not come as a man traveling upon the earth until his kingdom is brought forth and set upon the earth at the second coming. This one likened to the Son of Man is not the Son of Man. The one likened to the Son of Man that Daniel saw is God the witness come in the flesh, who Joseph Smith saw that he would come in the last days and do the uh, do same or similar things as Jesus did. Jesus is Messiah ben Judah, the King Messiah, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Messiah ben Yosef, the witness or the Holy Ghost come in the flesh, is that second Messiah or uh, anointed one that is spoken of in, uh, in Zechariah chapter 4 when it speaks of the Lord of the whole earth and his two anointed or his two messiahs. This man traveling upon the earth who is God the witness will be one of the two witnesses in the book of Revelation chapter 11 who is put to death in the street, murdered, lays in the street for three days and three nights, marred beyond recognition, while the whole, the whole earth rejoices at his death and the death of his companion. And at the end of three days, Jehovah our Elohim will call down out of heaven, and you can see this in the book of Revelation, and their bodies will be made restored, and they will go up in resurrection, and the whole earth will see them resurrected. And I asked God why this had to be, and he told me that with Jesus Christ, or Yeshua HaMashiach, that anyone could say that the, 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 the apostles stole the body. Even though there were over 500 at one time that saw Yeshua as a resurrected person. But when Messiah ben Yosef ben Ephraim comes, God the witness, the, the Holy Ghost come in mortality, and they see him put to death, they will laugh, and they will see he is no prophet that he is deluded and he is false. But when on the third day they see him caught up with his companion and all of the saints who believe that he is a servant, when they are caught up in what the, the modern Christian church calls the rapture and everybody else is left, it says that great fear and dread come upon those people because at that point they will know 
that they murdered the second witness of the father, Asaya ben Yosef. When he is resurrected, when there is a people who will live all that God has commanded, and that kingdom is established on the earth, and Michael, who is Adam, the Ancient of Days, sits upon the throne and receives all of the prophets and all of the kingdoms and all of the keys, that one likened to the Son of Man will come down and be the last one to receive those keys before they are given, or not receive them, give up his keys to Michael before Jesus himself, Yeshua, returns in the second coming. And the whole earth will see him. In Daniel chapter 7, it says that they will, uh, he will come down out of the mountain and that he will be led to Michael. Yeshua won't have to be led to Michael. Yeshua will go there of his own volition. So, anyway, there's, uh, you know, Scripture is not for private interpretation. And in order to understand Scripture correctly, you have to get the interpretation from God himself. Everything else is speculation. Everything else is speculation. A lot of people assume a lot of things in the Scriptures, and they say, oh, it says this and that and whatever, but they're assuming they know what they're talking about. And they, they wander around like they have some kind of authority and they have none because they're not prophets. You know, these, these many people throughout the whole world that, that believe in apostate Christianity, you know. Anyway, <clears throat> continuing on. I saw in the night vision and behold, one like the Son of Man, Messiah ben Yosef, came with the, with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So he comes before Yeshua. I mean, he comes before Michael Adam, and who is the Ancient of Days. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that shall not pass away, and his kingdom and all people, nations, and languages should serve him, and his dominion is an everlasting dominion and shall not be destroyed. Let me just say, okay, there's more understanding that has to go into this. In the millennium, there will be two portions of the kingdom of God upon the earth, ruled over by, by God the Father. The political portion of the kingdom of God, the military portion of the kingdom of God, will be our, yes, our, um, God the Witness come in the flesh, who is Messiah ben Yosef, he will be over that political ping- kingdom. When Jesus Christ comes and returns, he will be over the theological kingdom. Hold on. Oh. <laughs> Your dog escaped. Kid, Kid's dog escaped. All right. Uh, Sam B- Sambato says he is from Ghana. Okay. So, uh, and I'll get to that. I'm going to read what you said there in a minute after I get done with the reading, and then we'll open up the phone lines for anyone who wants to call in. Uh, there are 100 lines available right now if anybody wants to call in just to listen. The guest call-in number is 917-889-8827, and I will not bring you on the air if you do not push one, so you can just listen. There's 100 lines available. If you do want to come on the air, the guest call in number nine one seven eight eight nine eight eight two seven and then push one when you're prompted or when you you know come on that'll let me know on the stu- on the studio that you want to say something on the air questions or comments only please all right. <clears throat> But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13, 14, and 18. We're on page 224. The Apostle John prophesied, quote, And the dragon prevailed not against Michael, neither the child, that's the kingdom, nor the woman which was the church of God. So out of the church, the woman, comes the child, which is the political portion of the kingdom of God, or 
who rules over at Yeshua. Well, it's um, not Yeshua. It's um, Messiah ben Yosef, God the witness. So, all right, let's see. Nor the woman, which was the church of God, who had been delivered of her pains and brought forth and brought forth the kingdom of our God in his Christ. Revelation chapter 7, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 of the Joseph Smith translation or the inspired version of the Bible. In this scripture, he says, the church of Christ will bring forth the kingdom just as the woman delivers a baby. If the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the true church referred to by John, then it should be the church to organize that kingdom or its officers. Not necessarily. The kingdom, the one who is over the kingdom of God, comes out of that church. But he is not chosen by that church. He is chosen by God to, to his office. Anyway, continuing. It should be the church to organize that kingdom and its officers. That is exactly what Joseph Smith said. Okay. The Latter-day organization of the church of God, or the kingdom of God. These early prophecies were were fulfilled when Joseph Smith organized the kingdom of God in 1844. He's talking about the church of the firstborn, or the council of 50, which Wilfred Woodruff did away with in 1892, four or six. I can't remember which year. They like did a whole. They did away with a bunch of stuff because the government forced them to. Basically, it wasn't just polygamy that was done away with. Governing members were called the Council of Fifty simply because it consisted of the of that number of officers. Brigham Young refers to its inception and describes its all-encompassing authority. Quote, this is Brigham Young, I will say to you, with regard to the kingdom of God on the earth, here is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, organized with its rules, regulations, and degrees, with the quorums of the holy priesthood from the first presidency to the teachers and deacons. Here we are an organization. God called upon Joseph. He called upon Oliver, Oliver Caldry, then others were called through Joseph. The church was organized. He with his two counselors comprised the first presidency. In a few years, the quorum of the twelve was organized. The high council was organized. The high priest quorum was organized. The seventies quorums were organized, and the priest's quorum, the teacher's quorum, and the de- uh, the deacon's quorum. This is what we are in the habit of calling the kingdom of God. But there are further organizations. The prophet Joseph Smith gave a full and complete organization to this kingdom the spring before he was killed. This kingdom is the kingdom that Daniel spoke of which was to be set up in the last days, it is the kingdom that is not to be given to another people. It is the kingdom that is held to be, or that is to be held by the servants of God to rule the nations of the earth, to send forth those laws and ordinances that shall be suitable and that shall apply themselves to the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that will apply themselves to the mother church. Now I want to give you these few words. The kingdom of God will protect every person, every sect, and will people upon the fa- every sect and people upon the face of the whole earth in their legal rights. I shall not tell you the names of the members of this kingdom, neither shall I read to you its constitution. But the Constitution was given by revelation. That means it had already been given at that point. I know what it is. You're going to have to go find it yourself because I can't remember. It's actually really, really easy. It's way simple. But uh, you'll have to find that on your own because I'm not going to misquote it, and I don't know where to find it right now. So what are you doing in the back of my car, little girl? You're trying to get the balloon? Are you going to pop it? You need to go ride your bike or something. I kind of like doing this. 
in the car like I'm doing it because I'm sitting in my driveway and the kids are playing and they're riding their bikes up and down the street and I'm watching them while I'm doing the radio show. So unfortunately the place that we're moving to is out in the country and there are no sidewalks, but there's a lot of land and only probably about five or seven acres is being leased. So the rest of it is ours to use. So, but they're going to have to learn to ride on gravel because there is no sidewalks there. (laughs) All right. Let's see. The day will come when it will be organized in strength and power. Journal of Discourses, volume 27, page 157 through 158. So in Genesis chapter 9, verses 21 through 25 of the Joseph Smith translation, and I know I quote this a lot, but when a people live all that God has commanded and they set up the kingdom of God on the earth in its fullness and do not restrict any of the laws of the kingdom of God on the earth, that people will then, when there is a people that live all that God has commanded, that is when Zion comes down out of heaven with the city of Enoch and the church of the firstborn, which Joseph Smith said rested and will return to its place in the Gulf of Mexico. That crater was not created by an asteroid. That's where the city of Zion and the land of Zion was taken when it was taken off the earth. And it will come back into that place. When that happens, Zion will be redeemed. But not until that happens. And that cannot happen until there is a people who will live all that God has commanded. All of the Moedim, the times and seasons, which Jesus told Joseph would be restored in 18, uh, well, in section 124, the revelation given January 18th, 1841, that was all supposed to be restored in Nauvoo if they were obedient. Unfortunately, they were not obedient. But um, in order for the kingdom of God to be established, there has to be a righteous people on the earth who live all that God has commanded. That includes plural celestial marriage, the law of consecration, united orders, the law of adoption, all of the rites of the temple, and every law that was not was not fulfilled by Yeshua as far as blood atonement goes. All of it. Only when that happens and Zion is redeemed, only after that can Yeshua return to take his place in his kingdom. That's why it's important for us to know as a people what it is that God has asked us to do. We have a ton. And I would say that the doctrine and covenant, as it was given in all the revelations that Joseph Smith received, are more important in the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon was given so that we can pray and ask God if it's a true book. And if we know that it's true and Joseph Smith is a true prophet, we will hear the revelations given to us in the Doctrine and Covenants and we will be obedient, obedient to them. So that Zion can be redeemed so that Jesus or Yeshua can return upon the face of this earth and take, pl- take his rightful place as king, and- king of kings and Lord of lords. Orson Pratt further explained the function of that kingdom and its members. Quote, The kingly authority is not separate and distinct from the priesthood, but merely a branch or a portion of the same. Priestly authority is universal, having power over all things, and kingly authority, until until perfected, is limited to the king, kingdom's place under its jurisdiction. The former appoints the, and ordains the latter, but the latter never appoints and ordains the former. The first controls the laws of nature and exercises jurisdiction over the elements, as well as over men. The last controls men only and administers just and righteous laws for their government. 
there are where the two are combined and the individual perfect, he has almighty power both as king and as priest or as a Melchizedek, which Melchizedek or Melchizedek means king and priest. And as the priest and as a priest, both offices then are merged into one. This distinction then will be merely in, the, in name and not in authority. Either as a king or as a priest, he will then have power and dominion over all things and reign over all. Both titles combined will then not give him any more power than, e- than either one singly. It is evident that the distinctions of title are only expressive of the condition of things prior to the glorification and perfection of the persons who hold the priesthood. For when they are perfected, they will have power to act in every branch of authority by virtue of the great and almighty and eternal priesthood which they hold. They can then sway their scepters as kings and rule as princes, minister as apostles, officiate as teachers, or act in the humblest or most exalted capacity. There is no branch of the priesthood so low that they cannot condescend to officiate therein, and none so high that they cannot reach forth the arm of power and control the same. End quote Orson Pratt, The Seer, which is a really good book, I suggest reading it, page 145, and that was published in 1853. The higher priesthood is the power and authority which directs both the church and the kingdom. (coughs) Excuse me. The following simple chart may help to clarify in the distinction. The holy priesthood. The church of Christ, the kingdom of God, the patriarch, the presidency, the high priest, Honorable men, apostles, honorable men. Um, okay, we're on page 227. So I think that there was a chart in the original book, and I don't have the original book. I'm reading this offline at ogdencrot.com. So definition revised. Unfortunately, like so many other principles and doctrines of the gospel, About the turn of the century, the definition and interpretation of the kingdom of God changed. It began to be taught that the kingdom of God was the same as the church of Christ, as these few few samples will demonstrate. So, when Wilfred Woodruff gave up plural celestial marriage, the law of consecration, united orders, and the council of 50... He gave up the kingdom of God on the earth. The church remains in its diminished capacity. When that happens, they start trying to say, well, this this needs to be this way because this and that. They they start changing definitions. Joseph F. Smith, he was the sixth president of the church. This is what he said. What I mean by the kingdom of God is the organization of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints over which the Son of God presides and not man. Gospel Doctrine, page 72. See, and this is how apostasy happens. The foundation, foundational prophet Joseph Smith gives us doctrine. The, the foundational leaders, they teach that doctrine. And then over time, Things get changed. And it's just like Isaiah said. They change the laws and the ordinances in the gospel. Over time, this happens. The reason why I call my program Fundamentally Mormon is because we are going over the foundation, the fundamental foundations of the restoration of the church upon the earth and showing how the church has diverted and apostatized and changed definitions, changed the gospel, changed the ordinances, or just gotten rid of things, which has happened, which I have clearly demonstrated since I started doing these radio programs in 2014. We have 
somewhere between seven to eight hundred programs altogether between the Kingdom of God or Nothing podcast and, and Fundamentally Mormon podcast. James Talmadge stated, who drives me nuts. I like his book, Jesus the Christ, but when he falsely states that Jesus and Jehovah are the same person, even though Joseph Smith taught that Jehovah, our grandfather, was the son of Jesus Christ, not Jesus Christ, when they contradict revelation that has been received, I have a problem with them. Joseph Smith taught that any man who contradicts the Bible, the Book of Mormon, or the Doctrine and Covenants, you set them down as imposters. So when these new guys change, and I know James Talmadge isn't a new guy, but he is compared to the Restorational Prophet, Joseph Smith. When these new guys go and change things that were clearly defined in the Restoration, they're apostate. And according to Joseph Smith, they're imposters. And when Joseph Smith says that any man who, who contradicts the Bible, the Book of Mormon, or the Doctrine and Covenants, I would say, and the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, who restored the priesthood and restored the gospel in its purity upon the face of the earth. Where they change his teachings. And the, te- the teachings of the foundational, basically kind of like the... It's kind of like Constantine changed what the apostles taught. Jesus Christ restored and set forth the kingdom of God on the earth. He had his foundational leaders go out and teach, and they taught. And over time, their teachings were corrupted. Same thing has happened. There is nothing new under the sun, according to King Shlomo or King Solomon. Nothing new under the sun. Anyway, continuing on. The kingdom of God is the church established by divine authority upon the earth. This institution asserts no claim to temporal rule over nations, which means it's not the kingdom, it's the church. Its scepter of power is that of the holy priesthood, to be used in the preaching of the gospel and administering the ordinances for the salvation of of mankind, living and dead. Jesus the Christ, page 788. Bruce R. McConkie stated, The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as it is now constituted, is the kingdom of God on the earth, which contradicts former statements of church leaders in the past. It is not the kingdom. It is the church. Nothing more needs to be done to establish the kingdom except for reestablish the cell. Well, okay, in DNC section 85, Jesus says he would have to send one mighty and strong to set the house or the kingdom of God in order. This implies it would be out of order. So when, Joe, or when Bruce R. McConkie states nothing further needs to be done to establish the kingdom, it's out of order, bud. It's out of order. You don't know what you're talking about. I can't stand Bruce R. McConkie and all of his manly, worldly wisdom. He has read all of these quotes. He should know better, but he's got to lift up the church and 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 put to death any uh, any of the true statements of of Brigham Young or John Taylor or Joseph Smith. That don't go along with the way his church is today. The church and the kingdom are one and the same. Mormon Doctrine by Bruce R. McConkie, page 415 and 416. Spencer W. Kimball. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was restored in 1830 after numerous revelations from the divine source, and this is the kingdom set up by the God of heaven that would never be destroyed nor superseded, and the stone cut out of the mountain without hand that would become a great mountain, and would fill the whole earth. Teachings of Spencer W. Kimball, page 433. Then why is it that in section 124, Jesus tells them, if you do not do what I say and building the temple so that the Father can come and restore that which was lost or that which was taken away, verses 27 and 28 of section 124, even the fullness of the priesthood, 
that if they do not do what they are commanded, that they will be rejected as a church with their dead. If Daniel's vision is seeing the stone cut out of the mountain being the church, and it will never be destroyed or rejected, why did Jesus say he was going to reject them, which he did? Because everything he said would happen in section 124 if they were obedient. All of that didn't happen. What happened was everything he said would happen if they were rejected did happen. This whole interpretation of the stone cut out of the mountain being the church, it's wrong. In Genesis chapter 49, we see that the stone of Joseph comes from the tribe of Joseph, right? This is Messiah ben Yosef, from the tribe of Yosef and Ephraim. Just like Jesus was a stone of Judah, Messiah ben Yosef was a stone of Ephraim, one of the two anointed of the whole earth. Not a savior like Jesus was, but a witness of the Father and the Son. God the witness, who Joseph Smith said would come. Who is cut out or excommunicated from the mountain, which is the church of Jesus Christ upon the face of the earth. The woman being the church gives birth to the Son, which is the kingdom or the king leader who, who comes to restore and redeem Zion, which is spoken of in, in De, uh, Doctrine and Covenants section 103 and, uh, and 105. The man like the Moses, the marred servant, he's all over Isaiah, but most people don't have eyes to see or ears to hear. Anyway, we're on page 228. I know this is uh, Spencer W. Kimball. Damn it. What do you got for food? No, this is not going to cut it for me. When I go to work, I work all night long, and giving me fruit and a couple sandwiches is not going to cut it. Okay, if this is all I get, sorry, if this is all I get, this is all you get to eat tomorrow. So if you want to eat a sandwich and some fruit, and that's all you want to eat tomorrow, because that's what you're giving me, Go figure it out. Go figure it out and stop arguing with me. I'm a 14-year-old. Like, he gives me like a, he's like, ah, Dad, Dad, I made you a sandwich. Because that's part of his job. He's supposed to start dinner and everything before Mom gets home. And he gives me a sandwich and, and some grapes and a little bit of cantaloupe. And he's like, here, have this. And I'm like, I'm going to work all night long. But anyway, <clears throat> Page 228. I know that this is the church and kingdom of God. So in the millennium, the word of the Lord will come out of Jerusalem and the law will come out of Zion. Those are two different portions of the kingdom of God on the earth. One is theolo- uh, theological, that's the church. One is, um, one is temporal, that's the kingdom. They're different. The church is not the kingdom. The church is part of the kingdom. But the ecclesiastical authority of the church is not the kingdom on the earth. So, uh, and the word of the Lord will come out of Jerusalem. That's the, that's the church. And the law will come out of Zion. That's the kingdom. Uh, continuing on with uh, Spencer W. Kimball. It has been part of me. Uh, oh, well, hold on. I know that this is the church and kingdom of God and has been a part of me. End quote. Faith precedes the miracle preface. Page written in Roman numerals. Page 18. Unfortunately, the definition and scope of the kingdom of God has been misunderstood. It was restored in this dispensation, but gradually both the definition and the organization were lost to the general membership of the church to summarize. All right, so we're going to summarize it, and then I'm going to take phone calls if I have any. There is nobody on the line. 
So anybody that wants to call in and have uh, quotes, questions, comments, can call in uh, 917-889-8827. That's 917-889-8827. And then if we don't have any phone calls, I'm going to go back and read the the stuff that was posted on the Facebook and uh, and then I'll be done. i got to go to work anyway. So number one, to summarize, the kingdom of God is a government consisting of a territory, a king, subjects, and laws. Number two, it is a separate organization from the church. The church pertains more to spiritual things and the kingdom to temporal rule and government. Remember? The word of the Lord will come out of Jerusalem and the law will come out of Zion. There are two separate portions of of the kingdom of God. One is theological and one is is, uh, government, basically. Number three, the kingdom of God comes from and is organized by the church. That's the woman giving birth to the son who who is the one that's over the kingdom, which Daniel chapter 7, where it talks about the stone, that's the stone of Joseph, Messiah ben Yosef, being cut out of the mountain of God, the stone cut out of the mountain, who goes forth and organizes the kingdom of God and restores and redeems Zion. This is the second witness of the Father. Number four. Church members and non-members may be officers in that kingdom. Number five, Joseph Smith organized a council of 50 as governing officers in that kingdom shortly before he died. And go and look at the history of the, of the council of 50. Like, there's so much the church, they just they threw by the wayside over the years. And they don't understand, but it's fascinating. Um, Jacob Vitrin. I think is his name. He he does a lot on uh, on Facebook, um, posting and studying and talking about that kingdom. So if you can uh, maybe look at him, uh, well, if you can find him, anyway, maybe uh, maybe I can tag him in a video one one of these days. Uh, number six, the Melchizedek priesthood presides over both the church and the kingdom. Number seven, when the organization of the kingdom began to dissolve, so did the correct understanding of it. Until now, the church, the LDS church supports the idea that the church and kingdom are the same. So, and that's the end of that. We don't have anybody on the call. Uh, And I'm going to read this stuff by this kid uh, in uh, Ghana. And then... um, I'm going to leave the phone lines open for anybody who does want to call. The phone number is 917-889-8827. And almacharityschools.com is Sambato's, Sambato Francis's uh, organization. All right. I guess the directors live in Arizona, and their names are Aaron Carr Sivert and Ben Sivart. Our mission. Which, like, I don't know if this guy's an LDS guy. Like, why isn't the church helping these people? Like, why are we building billion-dollar temples and having $8 billion in tithing taken in every year and having $32 billion in the stock market, but we don't do what Jesus Christ said the church is supposed to do? Like, we give less than 10% to humanitarian aid, which equals about 2 or $3 per member, <clears throat> and then we use the rest for building temples and whatever. All right, this is the statement of uh, the charity that um, Sambato Francis was uh, posting. We believe in educating the heart and mind of children. Of a child means giving him or her opportunities to grow spiritually, physically, emotionally, and intellectually. Our Savior Jesus Christ is our example in everything we do. 
Like him, we desire our children to also increase in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man, Luke chapter 2, verse 52. We provide opportunities for them to grow spiritually by teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in both word and deed. We feed them, clothe them, and take care of their medical needs so they can grow physically. So it's kind of like an orphanage. <clears throat> we provide math, English, reading, science, history, and vocational classes to give them the opportunity to grow intellectually. We involve them in service projects, social activities, and cultural events so they can build meaningful co- co- uh, connections with others. We believe these humble children who live in extreme poverty are the salt of the earth. We know education is the key for them to reach their full potential, and we and be examples and leaders of positive change in the rising generation. We all believe that our service to these wonderful children is just one way that we can show to our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. It is to honor, it is an honor to do this holy work and be inspired by the Lord on how to love and serve His precious little ones. So and you can find their website at www.almacharityschool.com. They're LDS people over in Ghana uh, trying to change the world, which is great if they're true, if it, if it's right. So um, I get a lot of people who send me um, requests for charity and uh, – you know, how easy it is it for somebody over in Ghana to say, uh, <clears throat> you know, get a computer and create a website and steal a bunch of pictures off the Internet or videos or whatever and, uh, and you know, scam people out of the money. And you're having money going to these charities that are not real charities. So I don't, I don't like the scamming, but... What I tell people to do with the tithing and offerings is if God inspires you to help that charity, then you do it. When you make the decision to give to any charity or tithing or church or any person, just tell God what you're going to do and then do it. If the spirit withdraws from you, then don't do it. So if um, if somebody, like, needs money and they ask me for it, like I had a friend down in California, who uh, I was friends with online on Facebook, and he said he he like we'd been friends for a couple of years, and one day he asked me for twenty bucks that he needs twenty bucks, right? And I was like, "You know what? I can do that for you. Maybe it was forty. I don't know. So I got his address and sent the mail to him. Now, I hardly hear from him anymore, which drives me a little bit nuts, but like I felt good. And I told God that I was going to do it, and I felt the Spirit, so I did. But if he asked me for that money that he needed, and I told God what I was going to do with it, because it's not my money, it's his money. All things are his. Nothing that we have belongs to us. And I told him what I was going to do with his money and helping this person out, or maybe this charity, and the Spirit withdraws from me, then I can know that I shouldn't that I should leave it alone, walk away from it. That's how you know if it's a scam or not. It, it's, a, it's a spiritual thing. But the more we do these type of things and get revelation and confirmation of the Holy Spirit, the more God trusts us and reveals to us, and the more he will reveal, v- reveal to us. So anyway, it looks like we have been on for an hour and 20 minutes. So we don't have any callers. So I'm going to end the program, give my wife and kids a hug goodbye and go drive a truck. So thank you for watching. Um, I'm going to try to do these radio programs in the afternoon. 
I know I've been bouncing around all over the place, but I figured that if I went out and I got a certain amount every night that I could get enough sleep in and I didn't have to rush and all that. So I'm going to try it and we'll see what happens. And hopefully when we get moved next month, I'll have my own office and everything will be set up and things can get more back to a normal schedule with the radio programs. But anyway, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you everyone for, for watching the program. Uh, tomorrow we'll be back on with chapter 15, the conclusion of the church and the gospel. And then we're going to get into another book called the church and the priesthood. So that'll be fun. So anyway, or the priesthood in the church, something like that. Anyway, uh, we'll be back on tomorrow. This has been a Zion's Redemption Radio Network program, fundamentallymormon.com. Take care, everyone. God bless, and goodbye.